so today, uh, as we alluded to last time, we're going to talk about um, figuring out what sample sizes you need, desire, you know, whatever word choice you like to use there. Um, as usual, I put uh, the notes or the you know notebook in the usual place. Um, one thing, just uh, there's a least one or two cells in there that are take a really long time to run so um just kind of keep that in mind if i left it the output there it's because it takes forever to run so um just kind of like i said keep it in mind it's uh mostly filled in today because a lot of the stuff you've already seen um but it's worthwhile to talk through it uh from this perspective uh and because you know i live for announcements um project two due on tuesday um and you know if you're thinking about going away for thanksgiving uh make sure you have it in before that you can always submit it on sunday or on saturday so uh just don't you know mess it up just because you want to uh go somewhere for thanksgiving uh whether you're an american and want to have lots of turkey or you're just taking advantage of the fact that it's a break and you can go someplace although given today uh someplace it's a little bit warmer um there is homework uh, and the course system thing is up. Um, I'm going to start, I think, creating generic announcements that have nothing to do with anything uh, just for the sake of entertainment value because I get bored. Um, for example, uh, you know, Mayor Wu uh, was sworn in this week. Uh, so first woman, first person of color um, ever be mayor of Boston and one of the very few actually kind of across the country to be mayor. Uh, so which is kind of cool. Uh, she's also a progressive um, and uh, that will be an interesting change. All right, so uh, I actually had this slide up uh, last lecture, I guess Tuesday, um, but it's worth kind of reiterating. So the distribution of all possible sample averages of a given size is called the distribution of the sample average. And we tried to approximate it by using the empirical distribution so when we observe in the world, um, and because of the uh, CLT, we can bet that it will be uh, roughly a normal distribution, uh, which then leads us to cool, useful pieces of math. Um, so that we can make uh, estimations based on that sample uh, in order to uh, identify you know, what we're looking for in the actual population. So for example, and this is, Oops, there's a typo here. I'm not supposed to say demo right there. Bad cut and paste from the other slide. Um, so uh, if you want the population standard deviation, um, or sorry, if you want the standard deviation, you get a population standard deviation divided by uh, the square root of the sample size, uh, as we looked at a little bit last time. Um, and then just to review, the central limit theorem states that if you have a sufficiently large sample set, um, you can draw at random from it, and but with replacement, right? And uh, this is, as I kind of mentioned last time, uh, combinations and permutations. There's two different types. Uh, you can have with replacement or without replacement on those as well. You probably learned the without replacement in the past, um, but if you think about the that math, uh, that's kind of a useful example. Um, and so it will come out, the just probability distribution of the sample average will come out as roughly normal um, and the mean will be close to the population mean. Uh, and so you can uh, start to get to useful data uh, because of the central limit theorem. All right, so a question for you all, um, and this is gonna be difficult to do with right hand and left hand, but we'll do right hand, left hand, and two hands, I guess. Uh, so. A will be uh, right, uh, B will be left, and C will be uh, both. Um, in the back, can you actually read these numbers on here? I wasn't sure if this is big enough. All right. Uh, so a population has average, an average of 70 and a standard deviation of 10. One of the histograms below is the empirical distribution of the averages of 10,000 random samples of size 100 drawn from the population. So now, what we're asking you is which one of these histograms is what we described there. So 
10,000 random samples of size 100, uh, which one of these looks like the right, the, or the correct one. So right hand for A or the first one, left hand for B and both hands for C. Wait for it. Don't make me ban phones back there. I wanna see left and right hands. I just read a big study yesterday, day before, uh, about why uh, some professors don't allow laptops or phones in classrooms. I'm very much on the fence being a heavy duty multitasker um, and one who takes notes on computers. Uh, I can't handwrite anything anymore, um, but it was an interesting argument. All right, so we have a bunch of people with the uh, right hand up, which I think what I said was A, right? All right, so uh, I think I saw you in the back. Um, can you tell me why you chose A? Either one of you. Okay, so so your your initial supposition is correct, right? <laughs> but if you notice all of the centers are actually around 70. Um, so, which is what you're looking for, right? So you expect it to be around 70 because the average of the overall population we know is 70, right? Because this question a little bit is, is cheating, right? We, we have a little bit on the first part already. Um, so we have a hint about what this should look like. However, I can tell you that A is incorrect um, and it's related to the standard deviation. So anybody who had, did anybody have the both hands up? You did? Can you tell me why you chose C? So, so yeah, so not bad. Um, so, and as you can tell, right, uh, there's a little bit of bias in my, my answer choices here. Uh, the center one is actually the correct one. Um, and so again, kind of your reasoning is correct, but your math is a little wrong. So basically we've got to remember that square root bit, okay? And so what we do, if we do the, if we kind of do out the math, right? We actually end up with a standard deviation on this populate or on this set of samples, not the original one, okay, of one. So in other words, this is the correct one because you see the standard deviation here is, is only about one. Okay, or you look at the inflection point here, right? So you know the standard deviation is at the inflection point here-ish, right? If you think about that curve. So then we know that's about one. So we know that the standard deviation, that this is the right one because we know the standard deviation should be about one. All right. Okay, so we're gonna play around with that some more um, and you'll have more examples, um, but this, this is the kind of thing that would be really easy to uh, put on a test, right? So uh, make sure you try to understand how this works um, and so that you can have it later. All right, so, but what we're really kind of talking about here is that, you know, we look at this, the inflection points, right? And so the inflection point here is about two, right? Um, so we would say the standard deviation on the incorrect one here is two. And then over here, um, as you kind of pointed out, uh, is the inflection point like here-ish, right? Which is about 10. So this is actually probably a pretty good uh, histogram for the actual population versus the sample set. Does that make sense? Because the standard deviation here is about 10, which we can kind of eyeball by looking at that curve, okay? Because we know it's, it's about like, you know, kind of as the, as the curve comes across, we know it's around in there. All right, so that's interesting, right? So what we know is that if we look at this curve, that the uh, standard deviation is, is basically this red dotted line um, based on where it lands kind of on the curve, okay? Um, and so, you know, if you, if you think about the curve from a mathematical perspective, right? You know, you know the numbers we were talking about before in one standard deviation, it's like whatever it is, 60 something percent. It's what would fit right inside the curve of 
two of the standard deviations here, right? So one on the you know positive side, one on the negative side. But that's not usually the uh, kind of number size we're looking for, right? We're looking normally for something a little bigger, okay? But once you have one, right, then then you can you know if you can find where this one is, then you can just take this line, right, and add it over here, and now you know where the second one is. That makes sense. Or if you you know if you know what the numbers are, if you know it's a one, right, then you know that this is going to be two. Okay, follow me. All right, so when we want 95% confidence, which is what we've generally been talking about. Um, so that's, you know, arguably it's two standard deviations or four, depending on your perspective, right? So it's, you know, two on one side and kind of by inverse, it's two on the other side. So four really total standard deviations is going to give us 95% of all the samples, or, you know, if we're talking about the, the drawing where we had um, the kind of the confidence intervals, right, we know 95% of that, of those sets of samples will land within this window, right? Um, and so that's a, another kind of useful piece of data. Um, and just let me see if there's anything else I want to put out on here. Uh, Yeah, so for 95% of all of the samples, they're going to land within those two blue lines. Um, and it's 60 or something percent. Uh, I have a, like a mental block uh, which will land between these two red lines. And it's all off the center of the population or the sample size. All right, so. For 95% of all samples, so this is just kind of the same thing written out, right? Is that if you start in the center and then you go two standard deviations on both sides, um, and then you can remember, right, because it's a normal distribution, you know that the distance on both sides is symmetric, right? Because you know, you know, you know that curve looks the way it does. So as a result, the, the right side is going to match the left side. Um, so if you take Two standard deviations on both sides, you'll have to capture the population average for 95% of all the samples. Um, I found like this was a hard slide to write in the sense that, so keep in mind, for 95% of all samples, even though it says here, it will capture the population average, it will capture 95% of the population average, right? I tried to use judicious, judicious use of bullets, but sometimes they're confusing anyway. All right, so uh, there's this horse here that we're going to keep feeding, um, but so 95% confidence interval for the population average. So if we're talking about those averages, now we start to have a very real uh, kind of window that we can look at uh, when we try to figure out the, you know, like when we're looking at these averages and knowing something about this environment. So that tells us that the total width of the 95% confidence interval is four times the standard deviation of the sample average. So then we get a new, like a new formula here, right? Which is that if we want to hit 95%, it's four times this standard deviation divided by the sample uh, size. All right, that's where we're the sample size, sorry. And then, just make sure I'm where I think I am. Okay. All right. So kind of changing tracks a little bit. Okay. So, you know, we have the, the cut slide. Um, so kind of, we know that about the four standard deviations, right? It's useful. But so let's look at kind of a simpler case where um, imagine we did a very, very boring survey. Okay. Where it only has one question and that question is a yes or a no answer. Okay. And so the yeses are represented by a one in the in the data set, and we had a, a couple of examples like this. And the noes are represented by the zeros in the population set. So, if we add up all of those data elements, right, then we will get a number that is just the number of ones, right? Because we're just going to add one a whole bunch of times together. Uh, and in this case, in this example, we have four of them. 
to now we have four ones. So the proportion of ones is four over 10, right? Which is the number of data elements, which is 10, and the number of ones, or the number of ones divided by the number of elements. And so we get the proportion of ones is 0. 0.4 uh, or 40%. Um, so the population mean is the proportion of ones in the population. So we know that the average is going to be uh, you know, 40 or 0. 0.4. Um, and we know that the sample mean is the proportion of ones in the sample. Okay, so we can kind of do the same thing, but on just the sample as well, and we'll get a proportion. So we can compare, you know, or at least think about the comparison of the population uh, versus the sample. If they're the same ratio, right, even if they're not the same number, if they're the same ratio, then we know that uh, they're equivalent, right? All right, so I don't know why I put this slide again. Oh, I mean, it's kind of here, but so, um, you know, kind of same idea. Now we can kind of combine those two pieces of data together, um, you know, about the standard deviations and counting ones, right? Or looking at the proportion of ones in the population. So if we look at the total width of an approximate 95% confidence interval for a population, well, then now we start to get something pretty interesting, right? So now we can take four times the standard deviation of that zero and one population, right? That's not a good interval. It's just you know, zero or one. Um, the narrower the interval, the more precise your estimate, which we already know. Um, and now we can maybe say, okay, so what if we want the total width of the interval to be no more than 1%? So how should we choose the sample size? And for an example, as I alluded to a few minutes ago, uh, Mayor Wu was just sworn in. So she popped into my head as a, as a, a you know, for an example. So kind of tying it back a little bit to some stuff we've done in the past, right? So what we want to know is the percent of voters who support Wu for mayor. So our, our really boring survey is, you know, prior to the election, um, you know, will you vote for Wu? Yes or no? We're not going to ask about any other candidates. Uh, we're not going to ask why, any of that stuff. We're just going to literally say, are you going to vote for this person? Um, so if we poll and randomly select voters, and so what we do, right, is as I kind of explained a couple of times, but if a voter I, okay, uh, supports Wu, then we make, then we mark a one for them, otherwise we mark a zero. So then we get our friendly P hat here, um, which is an estimate of P, right, because so P hat represents the fact that it is uh, from a sample, right, it's an estimate. Um, and so that's the sample mean. And so if we take the sum of all poll results and basically add up all those I's, right? Uh, the letter I, not the people. Um, sum of all field poll results, divide that by the total number of entries or the total number of people we surveyed, um, we can get to an estimate of P, right? So what that leads us to, right, is that P hat is 0.5% from P or in other words, um, and I, I don't think we've used these before, but these bars mean absolute value. So whether this comes out negative or positive, it'll always be a positive number. So we take P hat minus P, um, and that's gonna be less than or equal to 0 0.005, okay? Because 0.5% is um, 0 0.005. All right, so, what we're really trying to get to is, so what sample size should we do for a given population? And why do we want to know what that sample size is, you know, at, like right around the minimum? Why don't we want it to be greater than the minimum? Anybody have any ideas? So if we're sampling the population, so we're going around and uh, making phone calls to people, asking them if they support Wu, and we know, you know, there's some minimum value of, of uh, survey respondents we need. Why don't we want to call more? And this is a pure non-mathematical answer. I mean, it sort of is mathematical, I suppose. Any ideas?
Uh, that doesn't happen that much. Um, but that's why I was kind of alluding to it's not really a mathematical answer. So don't think about it in terms of statistics. Think about it in terms of making phone calls. So if I need 100, why would I want to avoid making 150 calls? Exactly. So we want the minimum because we want to get to the cheapest answer we can get to, right? And cheap can be measured on a lot of different fronts. Um, you know, like you could also, you know, it's time and money to collect the data, but it's also time and money uh, to calculate the data after that, right? You know, if your minimum value was, you know, I don't know, a million um, and you collect 5 million, 5 million is even just more expensive just to calculate, right? So, uh, so kind of, you want the cheapest answer, like I said, where cheap can kind of mean, you know, lots of different things. Um, and so that's why you want to try to find this minimum. Um, but on the flip side, you want no smaller, right? Because then the quality of your answer goes down. So that leads us to a little bit more math. Okay, so we know what we want is in this case, right? We want to know uh, 1% um i don't know you can read it but like four times standard deviation of that zero and one population divided by uh, the square root of the sample size um so if we want the max total width like that you'll accept so you want to be within one percent of the answer um and then you know so we can kind of lay out the math that way and then we're gonna then we can uh i can't remember what property it is but you can you can kind of move around the the terms right um as long as it stays equal and that starts to get interesting, right? Because now we know that we have the sample size on the left side of the equal, right? I mean, we gotta get rid of that square root too, but um, now we actually have a piece of data over there that we can, that we're looking for. Uh, so that makes things a lot easier. And I think, yeah, so now we'll talk about it a little bit more. And, For, sorry, let me open, make sure I'm in the same place. Um, so for, by way, kind of, by way of context, right, uh, we're opening our favorite uh, delays for United Airlines. Um, I don't know what the bias is towards United, probably that was the data we could grab. Um, but so we can get to, um, you know, a population mean, and we can get to the uh, standard deviation, and we kind of know how to do all this stuff. Uh, where we can go and, you know, make a couple of functions and then actually calculate. Uh, I felt like, yeah, that, that felt like it went really fast. Um, but so, you know, we take a population size of 100 and we get, you know, a relatively jagged plot uh, with a bit of skew. And we do the same with 400, but I'm just going to show you rather than running it. Um, but then we get to 900 and it starts looking better and better, right? So then we start to look at, okay, the sample, or uh, sorry, the uh, standard deviation of the sample mean. Um, and what I wanna show out or show you here, right? Is we can calculate that using that uh, standard deviation um, on our 10,000 sample means um, or, oops, that was the one I wasn't supposed to run. Um, but uh, uh, for you know these ranges, right? Uh, and the reason we want to do that is because we want to look at, right? Because we're using MPA range there. We're actually looking at a whole bunch of different sample sets between, or yeah, a whole bunch of different sample sizes uh, for ten thousand tests uh, between one hundred and nine fifty, uh, stepping by fifty. Okay, so that means we'll get. 100, 150, 200, etc. Um, shoot, that was the one I wasn't supposed to run. Um, now it's taking forever.
find. Really shouldn't take that. One. Uh, so I've been using VS Code lately to also run notebooks, which I know some of you in here have used. Um, but what's kind of cool is at least it makes you feel like it's going faster because instead of just a asterisk up there, it actually gives you the time, like a counter. Um, it's not counting down, mind you. So it's not really giving you any more information, but the fact that it's moving makes you feel like it's moving faster. Oh my goodness. All right, I'm nearly out of patience. So let's see if I can show here. Okay, so what we want to look at here is the standard deviation, okay? And so we get the, the standard deviation of the value, uh, you know, of the sample size that we were doing before. And we look at the population standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. Um, and, you know, what do we notice, right? They're about the same. Right? So we get, um, so this is kind of potentially a shortcut to this data, right? So that we can start to figure out what that sample size should be. Um, and let me just see if my other one is done cooking. Yes. All right, let me just bring this back over here. All right, and as expected, oops, or I think you should expect, <clears throat> excuse me, as the sample size goes up, right, we not only get closer and closer um, to the uh, to the predicted one, right, but also it gets smaller. So those are good things. But most of this we've seen before, at least talked about before. Uh, and so then we kind of move on to, this might be going a lot faster than I thought it was going to be. So then uh, just to kind of mimic the example we gave before, we're just going to create a, an array of this zero one population, okay? Um, and yeah, so, but we're only using two ones uh, and a size of 10. So now we just have an array with just two of them in it. Um, and so from there, we can go and estimate the standard deviation or we can calculate the standard deviation. Um, does anybody know what that's gonna be? Anybody beat me to the punch from the uh, notebook? All right, so we can calculate it by hand, but we're going to use the handy MP function. Um, and we see that it's 0.4, uh, which is handy. And so what we want to do is now look at what we're trying to understand here. Let me see. Oops. So what we're trying to figure out here, right, is how do we get to, you know, kind of a good standard deviation. Um, and so, so first, I think we just set up this function here. Um, and then we can kind of look at different versions by creating the, oh sorry it's done already. um so we can look at this kind of scatter plot of the proportion of ones uh and the standard deviation and what we notice right is that you know it kind of arcs here right so what we can do is we can say okay what we we have kind of the most variability up here and then maybe less so out here But long story short is that we're, you know, to try to figure out what our sample size is, um, you know, this is kind of like we're showing some of the kind of proof behind it about why this should work. 
but we can then go and now figure out what our sample size is by using those estimates using the square root. And so we look, well, so, so this is kind of our, our optional values. And so this is kind of the worst case scenario, right? So if we can calculate it using the worst case scenario, if we can guess what the worst case will be, then we can use the worst case possible, right? So it's not just the kind of worst case, it's the literal worst case. So then we can take the worst case and combine it with the kind of function that we know. And then we can confidently say that our kind of results are in the worst case where we want them to be, or in the best case, better than that, okay? Because is, is kind of remember like from uh, uh, when we were talking about the standard deviation sizes, right? Like, um, you know, 95% uh, of the population is within that, those four standard deviations. But it doesn't mean it's only 95%. It just means that's the worst case. Does that make sense? So it could be over 95%. You know, it could be 100%. Who knows? The point being is just that it won't be less than 95%. And the kind of, we're doing the same kind of thing here. We're kind of saying, okay, I want to calculate the, or I want to know that the worst case is what we're representing so that, when, you know, if I get to the confidence level I want, then we know it will happen in the worst case and it could be better than that. And that's great, but irrelevant, right? Okay, so. So that leads us to basically kind of an expansion of the formula we were looking at before, which is that, so now we know the square root of the sample size is equal to four times the standard deviation of the uh, zero and one population divided by um, the, like the um, confidence that we're looking for um, of 0 0.01. Um, and so we know that that population is at most 0 0.5 because here, right? So that lets us put in place of this value, which is the one we don't want to, like we can get it on the United table, but we're gonna pretend like we can't. So we wanna get rid of that number, right? We wanna put a hard number in there, but we want the worst case of that hard number, right? So that we can actually calculate against it. So now we know, that the sample size, this or the square root of the sample size is greater than or equal to four times 0 0.5 divided by uh, 0 0.01. That was very difficult for me to say. Um, so if we then do it, you know, just do the math, right? And we do we put the square root in the right place by uh, getting rid of it by just squaring the result. Then we know that our sample size needs to be 40,000. Right, makes sense. Okay. So, um, and and basically, so it should be forty thousand or more. But kind of going back to the you know the cheap factor, we really would rather it be real close to forty thousand because it'll be cheaper on lots of different directions. So. So this is interesting. Um, so we're kind of talking, I was talking about the, uh, the Wu election, but you know, think about this as a US national election, um, which at the time of this writing was 260 million, give or take. Um, so if you think about any poll you've ever seen on you know, politics in particular are ones that get well publicized, um, but you know, how often have those polls been, they took 40,000, people as their sample, right? Pretty rare, okay? So there's this cool Scientific American article uh, that explains this, um, but we're gonna talk about it here, which is basically that, um, okay, we know it was 40,000, right? But what's the difference in this, you know, of course, obviously uh, overblown headline uh, between what we did just now and this, okay? And assume for the sake of argument that the 260 million uh, is irrelevant, 
that we were, you know, we were working with the same number. Um, we thought we needed 40,000. So what, what is the difference between this headline and what we were just looking at? Any ideas? And I'll, here, I'll put the other thing back up. It may not be obvious, but I was hoping maybe you would see it. There's only one number other than the ones I talked about. So what else could it be? Any ideas? All right. So this number is maybe not not experientially right is a lot bigger than our one percent confidence okay so yes they're very close to each other uh, in terms of real numbers right but as far as trying to do this stuff um they are actually quite a bit different all right so different in fact that you can get to a represent a representative sample of 260 million off of a thousand participants. But, right, your margin of error, your confidence goes way down or up, depending on your perspective, right? Um, but your margin of error goes up. So, I'm kind of wondering because we have a lot of time. Um, I was wondering if uh, we can kind of leave it as an exercise to the reader. So, here's the calculation. All right, most of you should have a notebook. Um, let's try to figure it out. Let me just do this real quick. So what sample size do we need to have uh, to get to a 3% confidence? Sorry, a little louder. Uh, you're correct on the first part, incorrect on the second part. Yeah, so, so we want to change our confidence factor. So this 0 0.01, uh, you know, we kind of established earlier uh, that the confidence we are looking for is a 1% confidence. So that's where that 0 0.01 comes into play. So instead, we are going to replace that with the first one. Yeah. Uh, we're going to replace the, uh, up there, really, to start with, we're going to replace that 0 0.01 with three, right? Or 0 0.03. Um, and so now we know that, um, you know, kind of everything else stays the same, right? Because we know the standard deviation is still, you know, the number of standard deviations we want is still four. We know that the, um, uh, you know, that the standard deviation of this kind of population is still 0.5, okay? Because it's always, it always will be. So that's always the worst case. Um, so then we can, basically just replace this number with our new 0 0.03 and we get a new value here by doing the exact same formula. Um, and so very simply, so you might want to give me the formula and I have it written down in case uh, we don't have uh, mistakes on my part because I'm good at them.
3%. Correct. Yeah, um, so to do the 3%. How do Um, parentheses, one five divided by zero point zero three. You would square all the Say that last part again, sorry. Square all the Okay. Yeah, so like this. Um, so yeah, the only thing I was gonna comment is that. Oh yeah, right. Oh, that's right. I think. Yeah, I thought that was wrong. Um, your parentheses are a little off. Um, so no parentheses here. I was trying to do the order of operations in my head. Oh my goodness. Do I have a typo? Oh no. Uh, sorry, I mean, or I explained it not awesome. Um, when we do the calc, it's uh, 0 0.06 because we want both sides. Oh, okay. So um, it's, it's so with what, because it's plus or minus 3%. Uh, so I should have explained that better on the prior slide. Uh, and that's why headlines are, you know, you probably should read the article. Um, so a 3% margin of error means plus or minus 3%. So the number here, is actually 0 .00, sorry, 0 0.06. Um, so in this, right, this number changes to a six. And if I had gotten to my other slide, um, I did it correctly there. Uh, so uh, basically, so it's exactly the same math, right? We just swap that 0 0.01 because we wanted a 1% error, right, which is Point and it's a margin of error plus or minus 0.5, right? Because we want, uh, you know, we want to be on both sides of the center um, with uh, 0 0.06. Uh, so if we go back here and we change this. So yeah, I thought that, so the parentheses of the order of operations work out just fine. Um, but as you can see, it's, you know, 1,111, um, you know, and then some decimals that are worth rounding. Um, and so we get to this number. Um, so I think it would probably be better to just go and get an extra person rather than try to get a 12th of an answer. So we can just round it to, you know, 1,112. Um, so that's how we can get to the plus or minus 3% is by uh, just kind of using the same formula, except we can use, you know, as long as we're going kind of around the center, um, then it's fine. Um, and now you see yet again why I use cheat sheets. Um, I wildly overestimated the amount of time this is going to take. Um, so that was about it. Uh, questions about this? Does this make sense, aside from my stupid mistake? All right, so the other kind of thing I would point out too, right, is that this is our, this is a huge problem we have, right, is that we don't know what size to choose for the samples. So whether we're doing the United data where we know a large amount of the population, um, or we take a look at that blue bikes data, um, for example, which was quite a lot larger, right? I think it was for two weeks of data, we had 350,000 rows. Um, this lets us get to much better answers on what kind of sample size we want to pull from that to do our 10,000 or whatever. Um, and so that we can get to good answers. Um, I don't know, maybe for, cause we have a ton of extra time, we can see what happens if we, let's see, take this, And this is probably going to be angry, but you know, ah, so it's for 
Oh, yes, it can. If this works, I do not recommend the hacky fixes. Um, all right, so this should give us a histogram with 10,000 examples or 10,000 samples of size 1,112-ish. Um, and theoretically, our numbers should be really, really close. So population mean 16.65, and the sample means is 16.63. I'd say that's pretty close. Um, then the population standard deviation is 39, and then the standard deviation of the one, if the sample means is 1.1, those we do expect to be different, right? Because we haven't, we haven't changed the population sample size to go up to that size standard deviations, but we do know that we have really good confidence or actually or less less than we did before but we know it's plus or minus six percent right around that value um and so but it's you know it's really really close so that's pretty good and it, it also tells us that the right answer for if we want to sample from that united population is 1111 or 12 technically um not 900, not 100, not 400, not, I, I don't remember what else we experimented with, 650, I think, or 625. Um, and that's, you know, kind of the way of it. Uh, so, yeah, that's it. Um, I totally meant to build more stuff as a backup, but then thought that was going to take longer. So there it is. Um,